Okay, this is the Math 140 lecture number 19 on annuities. So the first point to make is that an annuity is an account into which regular payments are made or regular withdrawals are taken while interest is compounded on that current balance. So in the Math 140 class we look at two uh, annuity formulas. The first one is just called the annuity formula is right here and the second one is the payout annuity and these are given on a formula sheet that we can use uh, in uh, in our exams because these are kind of big formulas that are kind of hard to memorize and so that's not really my objective here is to have you memorize these but to learn which one to use in what situation and what are they for and etc. So the first annuity formula what I'll point out is this P sub n is the balance in the account after n years and so when you're using this formula we can refer to it as like a future value annuity formula. It tells you what the amount will be in the future with regular deposits. D is the regular deposit. The amount that you deposit on periodic uh, uh, periods, you know, uh, on a regular on a regular basis. So it's typically, um, most examples I'll do are monthly payments. We might see an example where there are yearly payments. Um, and that's pretty much it, but it could be any frequency during the year, any number of times per year. And that's what K represents. It's the number of compounding periods, which is exactly the same as the number of payments in this formula. K represents the number of payments and compounding. And as you can see here, R is the annual interest rate in decimal form. That is to say, without the percent sign. Uh, you have to convert out the percent sign. But uh, because R represents annual interest, uh, and because n is years, k also has to be the number of compounding periods in a year. So they all have to be consistent with that annual uh, time frame. All right, so let me take a minute just to point out the difference between these two formulas. The significance, or the difference between them is, this one will tell you the future amount after n years if you continue to make payments into an account, if you're adding money into an account, which is also earning compound interest this is the formula to use. Generally, what, when we are using this formula, we're beginning with zero dollars in the account, and then we add payments, and then with the compounding frequency, there's interest earned on the current balance, another equal payment is made, interest is earned again, and it continues on that, on that way for a finite amount of time. The payout annuity, what's happening here is there is already a current balance, and that's what P0 is the current balance that's already in the account that's not zero and D now represents withdrawals from the account but you're still calculating interest on the current balance whatever was there as those regular withdrawals are made so th there's still compound interest earned uh, as withdrawals are made a withdrawal is made, then interest is earned on the current balance, and then another withdrawal is made, and interest is earned on the remaining balance in the account. Another withdrawal is made, and whatever is left earns interest. And otherwise, these R, K, and N values all represent the same thing as they did in this formula. And of course, if you look back, lecture 18, I was talking about how a payout annuity is exactly the formula that we would use to calculate uh, payments um, for a loan. With the loan formula, we're basically doing the same thing that we're doing with payout annuities. We might have a starting loan amount, or we might have a loan payment amount. We could calculate either of those two values. Of course, you could calculate any of these values um, if you knew all the other ones. All right, so let's turn our attention to an example. An investment of $200 is made every month for 10 years with 4% annual growth compounded monthly. What's the final value? So $200 every month that also earns interest periodically each month a 4% annual growth that is compounded monthly. Um, we're going to figure out how much have we saved total. Well the first thing of course will be to identify which of these two formulas to use. Uh, and recognize that it isn't just compound interest, it's the annuity formula, right, because of the periodic payments. So you've got to look at those, look for something, you know, like payments made every month, withdrawals made every month, that's when you have an annuity. Right? So this is the future value annuity. The formula that applies here 
is the one that tells us this future amount, p sub n, as a function of all these payments. So again, I want to emphasize to write down the formula first that, you know, for homeworks and exams is partial credit right there for identifying the right formula. And then write that formula again, completely everything with the appropriate numbers in place. And then you can take a couple of steps or you can do it quick uh, when you simplify. So once again, what do all of these values represent? P sub n is the amount after n years. D is the regular deposit. R represents an annual rate. K is the number of payments and the frequency of compounding. So in this case, we could see $200 payments, and we've got 10 years. So D is 200. N equals 10. R is 0.04 to get rid of the percent sign. And the being that it's compounded monthly, K is equal to 12. So let's write all the values in. The one that we don't know is the future amount, exactly what it's asking for. Okay, at that point, you could probably type it all in at once in the calculator, but there are a lot of grouping symbols, and it is possible to mess up. And what a shame to mess up if you completely understood everything and then just typed it in wrong. Uh, let's be careful about that part as well. And I think, again, I think just typing in the brackets alone um, can uh, can help a lot. And, and particularly here, like when we get things like this 0.04 divided by 12, if you were to do that alone, you'd get a value that you'd have to round off. And then this exponent, this is pretty big, 120, if you round off in this value and raise it to a large exponent, you are compounding the error of rounding off. And it could have a huge impact in your final answer. You could be really way off by rounding this incorrectly. So this is a good sort of compromise to do all of this in the calculator, just that. And just to be very careful about this, write everything else down and then just do that on the calculator. So I'm going to type in all of this on the calculator first. You could type in 10 times 12, or if you could do it in your head, it saves a step or a keystroke, maybe. Uh, minus 1, don't forget the minus 1. It's just those things, little things like that. It, uh, people get these things wrong on exams uh, because of just little details. Uh, so be very careful. You can mess up anything, you know, at any point. So that looks good. 0 0.4908. And because I want to round off being money, maybe two places after the decimal or to the nearest dollar. Um, overall, exactly how many places doesn't really matter. It seems easy enough to write down four in this, in this particular situation. So what did I have? 0 0.4908. I'll write that down. 0 0.4908. Technically, it's no longer exactly equal. It's approximately equal, but pretty accurate. And now we can type all this in and get a pretty accurate value. Now to get that in, you see this is an issue right here. If we type that in alone and round it off, uh, we will be uh, causing more error in our final answer. So it's better to leave that as a fraction, but to make sure that I really get that uh, in correctly, I could use a parenthesis here. Say divided by 0.04 divided by 12. So 29,448. Okay, so typing those values in, I get 29,448. And of course, I want to check to see if this is correct. Uh, this is approximate because I did round off, but how did I do? Let's compare with some online calculators and Excel. So let's go to Google and type in savings calculator as an option. And the first one that seems like to come up that might be good is a website I've already used, Bankrate. Let's take a look at that one, see what that provides. All right, so bankrate.com calculator. And I have to have an initial deposit here. Now, I think what's going to be an issue is that 
I have to put something there as an initial deposit. So let's say it's just one dollar. Let's make monthly contributions of two hundred, a period of ten years, with an interest of four percent, and see where we are. All right, that seems to be the right kind of ballpark. I was in in around twenty nine thousand when I was estimating, but of course this is. It's not clear as to whether it's calculating at the end of each period or at the beginning. Let's switch this to 200 just to say, all right, still not quite the same thing that I'm coming up with. I'm looking for 29,448, something like that. So with that puzzle there, we can look around for some other calculators. One that, another one that comes up is this nerd wallet trying that one you need to put an initial deposit also for this one starting at a hundred is the lowest I can put so I'll keep it there and then make monthly contributions of 200 over 10 years at 4% compounded monthly close but still not exactly the right value that I want I can't put that to zero that just doesn't work if I put that up to 200 Okay, so I think I know what's going on here. Let's take a look at one more website. This is calculator.net. Just type in that. Uh, and looking in calculator.net, look at the financial calculators here and go down to this one, finance calculator. In the finance calculator, you can see that there's this option. Well, first of all, I'm set, I'm on the option for future value here. The number of periods, I'm going to try 10. Let's say the starting principle is zero. Interest, you know what I think I need to do is say, because this interest, well let's see what happens. So I'm going to put that at 4% and make payments of $200. All right, I think I need to set that the number of periods as actually 10 years times 12 months. I'm going to go with 120 periods. No, that's not right. Okay, so there it is. That's the value that I'm looking for, about 29,449.96, and that's with 120 periods. So in this calculator, periods represents the number of payments, and in this case, the number of months. 10 years times 12 months, that's where I get this 120. This one allows me to have a starting principle at zero. And then what I needed to do here is put the interest per period. And I had a 4% annual rate, 4% divided by 12 is 0.3 repeating. So if I put in enough threes there and hit calculate, I'm getting this 29,449 that I know is the very, very accurate value. Also, I have the payments um, at the end of each compounding period. That is, I'm assuming means interest is calculated, then a payment is made. And that gives me 29,449, and that's a really accurate value. That's basically what our formula from our class, from our formula sheet, that's what our formula is generating. We can go back and look at that again a little bit more closely. You see, if I had actually typed all of this in, the calculator, without rounding anything off, I would get 29,449.96. Type in everything. I need two parentheses here. Raised to a power 120. Minus 1. And then divide by this quantity, 0.04 divided by 12. So that's as accurate as I can get on the calculator. 29,449.96. That's what I'm getting on calculator.net. 29,449.96. It's kind of neat to see the graph of um, actually the steady increase in the amount due to the payments and how the balance is beginning to go higher and higher from this increasing interest. And so I could say that at the end, the total amount that I have is 
81% based on all of those payments, $24,000 in payments, right? This is another sort of interesting thing to, to, to look at. Let me just say, um, of course, if we had made $200 payments and we multiply that by 120 payments, that's $24,000. So that's about 5,400 something in interest. Right? About $5,449 in interest, which is about 18, 19% of the total balance. Now we can get different answers depending, slightly different answers depending on whether we're calculating at the beginning. Payments, the payments are made at the beginning or at the end. So that just changes a little bit. And exactly the difference here is that, you know, about whether or not you are making payments at the beginning of a compounding period or the end. And you can see this reflected. What this calculator is doing is precisely what Excel would do. Excel offers us both of those options. So what I've done in Excel here is I've said, well, let's make a uh, entry for whatever our payment is. Let's just type in an annual rate. Then what I'll do here is get a monthly rate, which is just that annual rate in cell B2 divided by 12. And then I'll just have enter in whatever number of years I want. And then right here, I'll have Excel calculate the future value of all of those payments with interest, where the first entry here is the uh, periodic rate, the the rate per period. So in this case, it's a monthly rate. Right? So the monthly rate is that amount in cell B3. And then this is actually the number of periods. And because I wanted, I knew I wanted to do monthly payments, I would just take B4, which cell B4 right here, which is the number of years, and just multiply that by 12. So you can see that's what I did. I typed in times 12. And then B1, cell B1, is the payment. And that's right there. And then the next entry is actually whether you have a starting balance or not. And so I put in zero as a starting balance. And then if you include a zero here, uh, it has the interest compounded. What I'm doing is I'm looking at that last option there. And if I, right before I type it in, I have, I can see that if I type it as zero, it's going to make the payment at the end of each of these periods. And that's what I did here, zero. By choosing zero, I get that value. And in this one, if I want the payment at the start, let's put that back. Everything's the same except at the beginning of the period. Type in a one. And that gives me that other amount, 29,548, if payments are at the start of each compounding period. 29,548 if payments are at the start or beginning of each compound period. And the formula that we're using on our formula sheet is actually doing it the calculation this way, where we've got all of these 120 payments all at an annual rate of 4%, which is a rate per month of 0.3 repeating percent. And that's why it's coming up with that answer. So I think I can explain where that value from Nerd Wallet is coming, 29,848. What I can do is just go back to Excel and say, it's probably doing something like this and just rounding up where it's going to actually, if I take a starting amount of, I'm going to make it 121 payments there, 121 months and 121 payments, because I'll just take that first amount as actually being kind of like this starting balance, that $200 starting balance that I had to put in here. So I had started with $200 and then I make $200 payments after that. This is what uh, Nerd Wallet predicts as the total balance. And I can see that's, that's what I get in Excel. Pretty close. Close enough. I think that's what it's doing. It's probably just rounding up. All right. Well, we've got one more question to do here. Number two, how much must be invested every month for 18 years to reach a million dollars, assuming 5% annual growth compounded monthly? 
So you notice I've set this to be payments every month and the compounding every month. That's necessary to use the formulas that we have on our formula sheet. They are um, assume these regular annuities, which is to say the payments and the compounding frequency is the same. And we now recognize that this actually means when it comes to checking this in Excel or online that these formulas are assuming that payments are coming at the end of each compounding period. That's using a zero uh, as the, I think that's, in fact, not, that's what it does by default. If you don't include that, uh, it does that by default. So I could just take those out, just put a parenthesis at the end. Those last, because they're in brackets, they were optional. So I'm going to, I'm going to get that exact value without putting zero as a starting amount and payments at the end of the compounding period. If I don't specify that, it assumes that automatically. So that's that's the default. And that's what our formulas on our formula sheet are are calculating exactly this value, right? So it's it's payments at the end of the compounding period. This first entry here is the uh, periodic rate. This is the number of periods, and this is the payment amount that, we're, that we have in Excel. So let's do this one. How much must be invested every month for 18 years to reach a million dollars, assuming 5% annual growth compounded monthly? Well, the, it's the same formula because we are looking at a future amount of $1 million. Uh, but the question here is actually going to ask us to figure out the value for D, figure out those monthly payments. So we are back to this formula. But in this example, we know the future amount should be $1 million. And we're looking for the payment required to reach that goal. So now we have 5% growth monthly again. So 1 plus the 5% interest monthly compounding. The number of years now is 18. And it's k value 12 again, minus 1. That's part of the formula. So we have n is 18. We have r 0.05 compounded monthly. So payments and compounding frequency, that's the k value. That's 12. So now we're going to simplify this and divide into a million to solve for d. Where the mistakes happen is right here. Uh, first of all, have to identify the formula and then put all the numbers in the right place. But then one of the very common mistakes is to start writing part of this work over here on the side and get out. Things get out of order and unorganized and it just falls apart and doesn't work. So write the whole entire thing down with just this portion here. Let's do just this on the calculator first. So we can simplify that with this is another issue where if you type 0.05 divided by 12, you'll get a decimal value that you would need to round off if you were going to write it down. But this 18 times 12, that's a big number. 18 times 12 is 216. So if you did round this off, you are compounding that rounding error 216 times, which will have a big effect in your final answer. So it's better to write all this out uh, type all this out and get a very accurate value rather than just doing only this part and compounding the rounding error. So continuing on at this point, I have exponent 18 times 12 minus 1. I get about 1.455. So let's write that down. So I'm just going to take that part and simplify it here, but I'm not going to type this in and round off because I will just get more errors. And we can go a little bit faster and be more accurate by just multiplying this onto that side and dividing by that quantity. So multiply this over there and divide. Right? So Actually, you could even say cross multiply. That's actually faster and more accurate. And now we can just type this in. OK, that seems like a lot every month. Let's see what we can do about checking that. So one thing I could do is just go back to Excel, check my work using what I already did in Excel. So what I had was 5% annual growth and 18-year period. 
So let's suggest that. 18 years and 5% growth. Now that's 69,000 overall, so let's put this up at like 2368 and see if that works. 800,000. Now this is way off because I actually had 121, not the, uh, wasn't referring to the cell. So what I really want to do here is the number of periods, which is the number of years times 12. So I really want B4 times 12. So that's closer to the same, but that's still not a million. So let's see, what could be going on here? Actually, 2864 is rounding off. That's what it is. I had 23, so I need 2864. Yep, that's just about a million dollars right there. Let's say 2863.5. Yeah, that get, reaches a million dollars, um, and it's not exactly a million dollars because this is a value that we got from rounding off in a couple of places. Well, I rounded off here. All right, so that's pretty good. I feel like I just want to conclude with some kind of comment about how I think if you want to do any career that has anything to do with finance, being proficient with Excel is, a, is an absolute no-brainer that you've got to do much better than just Excel but at least have some basic facility with with doing calculations in Excel as a as a starting point so hopefully this is this has been helpful for that purpose okay maybe you should just do one more example here to include a payout annuity in this video so number three how much must be in an account initially in order to be able to withdraw 5000 every month for 20 years, assuming a 5% annual return in the account that's compounded monthly. So now you notice that we're looking for how much must be in the account initially. That's the P0 because we're going to withdraw each month. And it's because of this, that's why you know this is an annuity. But you still have to decide which annuity, future value or payout. And it's a payout annuity because we're withdrawing money from an account. We actually have, this question is actually asking us how much we have to have there to, in the account to start. Um, and this is our, our uh, withdrawal amount, 5,000. Of course, it's 20 years, so we know N is 20. The rate is the 5%. And this is another one with monthly payments and or monthly withdrawals and monthly compounding. So we know the K is going to be 12. So the formula that we're using is the payout annuity formula. And it has um, D, the, the withdrawal amount, bracket 1 minus, and you do 1 plus R over K with a negative exponent, N, the number of years, times K. And everything is divided by R over K. So again, just looking at the mistakes that I see in homework, what I really strongly encourage is that you write out the entire formula first, just to make sure you copy it down correct. People just write the formula wrong, or um, they'll make little mistakes with, you know, um, well, first of all, you have to make sure you know which formula to use and then copy the formula very carefully. And then let's write down the formula with all these values that we know in there. And that getting that part is at least some partial credit. So so now what do we have? It's uh, withdrawing 5000 every month, 20 year period, 5 percent growth. OK, and we're looking for what is that starting amount that needs to be in the account. So we know it's 5000 withdrawn, interest rate 5%, monthly compounding, negative is in the formula, 20 year period, 12 times a year, everything divided by 0 0.05 divided by 12. The next place that the mistakes happen is uh, here. What we need to do is simplify this first because 0.05 divided by 12, it's not going to come out exact. You're going to have to round off, but you've got this 240 power here, 
which is going to compound any errors that you get from rounding off. So just type in this part. Simplify that alone. I mean, you could type the whole thing in all at once, but let's just take this as a nice compromise here. Just type that in. Okay, so typing this in. Don't forget the negative. 20 times 12. 0.6314. Four places is good for most of these calculations to do four places in the intermediate steps. Uh, so 6314. Okay, and then we could just type that in and then divide that by this fraction. You see how I'm actually having the calculator do that so that I get a more accurate value. If you did that separately and wrote it down, you'd have to round off and you'd be not quite as accurate. So $756,480. We need $756,480 in the account to start. One thing that's really impressive and neat about this particular calculation now is if we go back and look at how much have we actually withdrawn from the account? If we go back and say, all right, we're going to take 5000 a month for 20 years. How much money is that total? So 5000 a month times 12 months times 20 years, that's $5,000 times 240 months. How much money is that? That's 1200000 and that is really impressive. You think, okay, wait, so you can actually withdraw 1200000 from the account, but all that we had in there to start was 756000 Yes, of course, and that's because over those 20 years, the money that's remaining in the account as each withdrawal is made isn't zero. There's still money in the account that still earns interest at this 5% annual rate. So you're actually withdrawing more from the account in total over that long period of time, more than was even in the account to begin with. So that's pretty neat effect of compound interest over a long period of time. All right, so I think that's going to conclude this video. I hope it's been helpful and uh, interesting.